Hi, my name is Jean Long with LCR. You know, we're going to talk about what we see some of the advantages of fiber versus cable. One thing I have learned is after lunch, if you bring toys for people to play with, they'll stay much more entertained. So Megan over there has some quad racks with a connector. If she can look at it and just pass it on down and look at it. And Ruben over there has fiber optics and a fiber optic connector that is used in airborne applications. So we'll talk about this. You know, if you look at the history of optics, is a telecommunication in the 1990s really started driving the need for optics. They deployed tons of it in their central office and in ground. From there, it went to the communications and the commercial IT. You know, if you go into a server closet or a telecommunications closet, you'll see a lot of fiber. Um, if you look at airborne applications, there's a lot of fiber optics on airborne. If you look at the 737, I am not sure on the new ones if there's hardly any copper. It's almost all fiber. And you're starting to see naval and ground mobile deployments use more and more fiber. I guess to this audience and the board vendor, they think fiber optics and they think high-speed processor. But when we look at it, there's a lot of other benefits for fiber optics and why you'd want to use them. So what we're going to do is kind of talk through those. So we'll look at what we view as a typical customer deployment. It's oversimplified, and I'll point to out where it's oversimplified, but it's a very basic one. Look at the trade-offs and the cost, weight, and routing. And then talk about some of the unique challenges of fiber optics. So let's get to the composite example. We're going to assume an airborne application, so you need to meet all the A-Rink standards. What's critical for these applications is a weight is really important for airborne applications. Today, with the push on affordability, cost is always an issue. Um, within an airplane, especially where the cable routes are, is EMI and EMC are very important. And what they really want is long-term reliability. And that long-term could be up to, I deploy this in a plane, and in 20 years, that same box and that same cabling is still working. Now, within the box, and this could be any bladed form factor, well, you'll have multiple blades and potentially RTMs. There will be I.O. coming from those. They will exit the box via a centralized I.O. connector on the top of the box or somewhere on the box. So they'll be routing, and all the external I.O. goes out through that connector. And then we're going to just pretend we connect it to another box. That's kind of a phony example, but you know, in reality, it'd be to sensors and other boxes all across the plane, but we'll simplify it. And we're going to look at the advantages of using for one gig Ethernet copper versus fiber optics. Um, we will include the connectors, the cabling, the mating connector, so any cabling or connector that's associated from the board all the way out. When we look at cost and weight, we won't look at the SFPs or items like that. Pretty simple. So let me talk about the two different ones we're looking at, and the fiber optics is over here. Single mode, loose structure fiber. It's pull proof. We'll talk about this later. And that connector that's passing around supports 12 Ethernet connections. And when the fiber does come your way, please don't say, I wonder how much force it takes to break the fiber, because it's not much. <laughs> the copper is Quadrax, and that's over here somewhere. Um, this is what a Quadrax cable looks like. It's very heavy. The connector will support six Ethernet, and it's heavily shielded, right? One of the beautiful things about fiber is EMI and EMC are irrelevant to fiber optics. For cabling or for copper, you need protection. So let's look about cost and what's the overall cost for our simplified model of going from the blades to a connector across to another box and back in. You know, for the cable, they're short, and when you're short, really the cable cost is not much. When you go to longer and longer runs, that's where the fiber optics cost starts coming in. A ballpark for a good ruggedized fiber optics cable is about 60 cents per centimeter. So 20 feet, you're getting into some cost. If you look at the connectors, and again, these are all mill standard connectors that are rated for airborne, is the fiber optics connector is a bit heavier, but the density is a lot greater. The Quadrax um, is, you know, only supports six, but it's lighter, but you also require something called strain relief. So if you look just within the box, or if your problem is I just need to get it outside of the box and it's someone else's problem, the cost of them is relatively the same. What's really driving that cost is the connector cost. When you take it between the boxes, 
that cost of the fiber optics becomes a lot more. And if you look at that total solution, fiber optics would be about um, $10,000 to support 12 gigabit Ethernet ports over there. And uh, Quadrax is about $7,500. So the fiber optics has about a 35% cost impact. It's 35% higher. But you know, with that 35%, you don't have to worry about EMI or EMC. Now let's go for weight. Um, fiber optics, this weighs about nothing. Um, if you go to Carlisle, who makes a lot of this cable, is they quote their weight in terms of kilometers. And I believe this weighs about 14.4 kilometers, or 14.4 kilos per kilometer of fiber optic cable. So the weight isn't significant. Um, Quadrax, because of the shielding, is a lot more. Uh, connectors, they're about equal if you take into account the density. So if you add up that configuration, the total weight of a Quadrax solution would be about 16 and a half pounds, and the total weight for a fiber solution is about two pounds. Now you're saying, okay, you know, it is 14 pounds, that's kind of irrelevant in the overall scheme, but you think about this on the number of boxes on a plane, the number of boxes on a ship, and it comes out to significant weight value. And every single engineer who's developing and deploying these solutions knows that trade-off is, okay, if I need so much of this, I'm willing to take that 35% cost increase to reduce my weight. Because you know, the fiber solution, when you do the math, is about 13% of a cost of a Quadrax cable. Let's talk about routing a cable. And this is the stuff most think, ah, uh, this is kind of boring, but it's kind of interesting. So Quadrax, you know, it's copper. There is a lot of industry history here, probably 70, 80 years on, people know how to route it. One of the things, and if you look underneath the Quadrax, there's these eight tiny little wires, because it is ethernet, is you do have to worry about the bend radius. You can bend it over enough where internally you'll break those tiny wires. Strain relief is important, is, you know, Earlier when they talked about ATCA and the vibration, is over 20 years you're gonna get a lot of vibration on this cable in a plane, on a ship, or even on ground mobile. And you wanna make sure that you release all the strain you can between the connector and cable. And here's a typical strain relief that those cables aren't gonna move and they are straight back from the connector. So there shouldn't be a lot of strain. And the other concern, especially with heavier cables, is chafing. Again, with the vibration, no matter how careful you are, they're gonna start chafing against each other. And if you have a lot of vibrations, if you're on a propeller craft, over 20 years, you're gonna start wearing through on these cables. But it's relatively simple. You know, optics is a newer technology. Um, bend radius is really important, and I'll say, please don't bend the fiber too much, you will break it. But you also need to understand how fiber really works to understand how it breaks. So let's look at the basics. If you look at the cable itself, there's two basic types. There's loose structure, which allows the fiber to move between the strength member and the secondary buffer. So if you think that little piece of glass in there, it is free to move within the connector. So it is a totally separate and freedom of motion over the jacket. You have a tight structure which here is there is no movement between the secondary buffer and strength member. It is one solid piece of a cable. You have connectors, pull proof. Pull proof is usually used where you have extreme thermal or you have moisture issues. And pull proof, you cannot pull the fiber out of the connector no matter how you try. You'll break the fiber optics first. Then there's non-pull proof, which is you can easily pull the fiber out of the connector under about five pounds of pressure. For most military applications, you're using loose cable with pull-proof connectors. If anyone wonders where tight structure and non-pull-proof are, look at the construction trades. Somewhere in this building, there's probably a riser versus fiber optics. It's in a nice controlled environment. Once it gets past the patch panel, no one is ever gonna touch it. So the tight structure is a lot cheaper, but it's not used for in really any hostile environments. The other thing that's interesting about fiber, it has been studied. The guys at Lucent, Alcatel, AT&T, et cetera, deployed probably billions of miles of fiber optics. 
And they found out it breaks in ways you don't expect. So they did a lot of studies. And this is one that I found most interesting. It was bend stress leads to what they call stress corrosion. Don't ask me how it physically happens, but what happens is the outer part of the glass starts corroding away. And that is based on time, based on the stress on the cable, and based on the rate areas. And what you'll find is it's not going to necessarily break instantaneously. Sometimes it'll break days, weeks, or months after deployment. And this is a real pain. If the plane's already in there, it breaks. They have to go and figure out how to take out everything to repair the fiber optics. So the obvious conclusion on this, right, is bend radius is critical. You never bend it smaller than a one-inch diameter. Be very gentle with handling it. Avoid putting stress on it, and all is well. Well, unfortunately, it's not that simple. So the next graph is kind of hard to see. But if you start over there on your right-hand side, that plastic piece is just a plastic ferrule. There's a little hole in it that allows the light to go through. If you can see right behind that white plastic piece, there's a small piece. That's a bare fiber. Right behind the bare fiber is some of the outer buffer jacket. You're moving back, and you see a spring back there. We'll talk about that in a second. And you see a little bare place. And then if you move further back, you start seeing the outer jacket. The outer jacket is secure to that connector, so it's not moving. <laughs> so if you look back there, what happens, and look carefully, is when you mate the connector, the fiber optics moves back. In theory, it's supposed to move back not really more than a half a millimeter, but in reality, it can move back up to a millimeter and a half. And that happens on this side or the board side of the connector, and also the mating connectors. Now, you may think, OK, it moves back. Well, think of this. This is a fairly short cable. This is about probably 30 centimeters. So I have a 30 centimeter outer jacket that's secured to the connectors. I have a piece of fiber. I push this one back, and I push this one back. All of a sudden, you're going to have a fiber within the jacket that is larger or longer than the jacket itself. right? So what happens, if I can get this right, is you start getting and this is oversimplified, compression within the jacket, that that fiber has to move because it just got pushed back, and it will start bending within the jacket. And this is where it starts breaking days, weeks, months, years after it's deployed. And this is called blocked cable breakage. Here's a picture of what a blocked cable breakage actually looks. This happened at the end part of the connector. And what, again, it happens is when you apply stress or you made it on both sides, there's a lot of stress from that jacket. And that fiber is looking for somewhere to move. And if it can't move freely within the fiber then the jacket, and within the jacket, it's restricted. And the results are going to be two things, is you're going to start decreasing or see increasing light loss. So from an application perspective, your throughput will be gone or decreased. And if you do a test, you'll see more light loss. And then this could break sometime in the future. And you'd have to really look at the bend radius and stress to determine it. So how do you address these issues? Because these are actually a pretty big problem in the industry. Is one of them is called preconditioning. It's basically thermal cycling of the fiber. If you look at the jacket, is over time, it can shrink up to 5%. Right? So that's a pretty big one. And it's more impactful on shorter cables. Um, but it can shrink up to 5% of its length over time. The fiber today is typically preconditioned in a spool. It's great, but if you're in a tough with a lot of thermal changes environment, you usually don't get penetration all the way through the spool to the fiber. So what you want is to precondition the individual fibers. An unterminated fiber, you cut it a bit longer than you're going to need to, and then you precondition that for basically 96 hours temperature cycling. Once it's done, you connect it, and it should be good. Another new technique folks are using is called optical backscatter reflectometry. Basically, what it's saying is even if the cable is not going to shrink, there may be defects within that cable. And what you do is you shoot a beam of light down the cable, and it reflects back. And you know a pattern what a good cable should look like. But what you'll see is defects in almost every single cable. And you have to judge, is this defect going to cause me problems later on? Where possible, use a service loop. And if folks don't know what a service loop is, next time you drive past an electrical pole, 
you'll see a big spool of copper there. That's a service loop. Is to prevent when you com compress both connectors, if you have a service loop in there, that expands the total length of the cable, and that three millimeters of stress that's going to be put on it will be absorbed over a much area, larger area. And limit restriction. Is there was a longest belief is you need to do the same thing with fiber. But what they found out, the strain relief constricts the movement of the fiber and causes breakages. So, you know, kind of in summary, there is a price premium for fiber, but in a lot of cases, the weight advantage is significant and it's worth it. Installing fiber is not the simplest thing, and there's the very obvious problems you have to worry about, but once you get into it, there's a lot of not so obvious ways it can break. And so what we believe is over the long run, you will see more and more uses of fiber, and you just have to be careful to make sure it's installed correctly.